All right, everybody, we are into the final week of material for the class, starting with King Richard II. This was written in, oh, probably about 1596, chronicling events in 1399. Now, we have already read material chronicling events in the early Middle Ages, okay? And we're kind of jumping back to that uh, again now. Richard II, both parts of King Henry IV, and of course Henry V, all take place before the Henry VI plays, and obviously before Richard III, which follows those. So we're sort of working backwards, I guess, in time. It's our own, our own little um, time machine, and there's probably a reason I decided to do things in this order, but I can't remember what it is right now, so let's just assume that we know and that it's awesome. As in most of Shakespeare's history plays, there is quite a bit of discrepancy between what we see on the page, or the stage, according to Shakespeare, and the actual historical truth as far as we can get at it. Historically, Richard II had a 20-plus year reign and seems to have been a pretty sound king. So, the question why the discrepancy? Why did Shakespeare make Richard look not that good? Simple answer, Shakespeare enjoyed his freedom and having his head attached to his shoulders. Shakespeare's queen, Elizabeth I, came from the line of Henry IV, who deposed Richard II, and so you don't want to make it seem like your queen's ancestors just for no reason at all decided to revolt against the powers that be. Also, folks in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and I guess we haven't changed that much really, were uncomfortable with the idea of revolution, uncomfortable with the idea of political instability, because political instability translates to general existential instability, which translates to the question of why the instability? Is there no plan? Is providence not a thing? Is this a random universe? And these were questions, these were ideas that folks in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and quite frankly now, were extremely uncomfortable with. So, both for personal reasons and political reasons and perhaps existential reasons, Shakespeare is not going to write a play in which a king who is doing a good job, a king who negotiated a truce in Ireland, a king who negotiated a truce with France to uh, put a, a stop, even if kind of temporary, to the Hundred Years' War. Shakespeare's not going to write a play that highlights those accomplishments and makes Richard look like a good king. He's just not going to do it. He has to come up with reasons for Henry IV to depose Richard. Now, that having been said, it's not as though Henry IV gets off scot-free. He does some questionable things, and we'll talk about those here in just a little bit. A really key scene, or a key pair of scenes in this play, start with Act 1, Scene 1. In this, the first scene in the play, Bolingbroke, who will be the future Henry IV, Bolingbroke accuses Mowbray of treason in front of Richard. Mowbray had been given money to spend on soldiers and the national defense and that sort of thing. But Bolingbroke says that Mowbray instead spent the money on, quote, lewd employments, whatever exactly that means. Mowbray acknowledges getting the money, but denies that he spent it improperly. Bolingbroke then accuses Mowbray, and this is kind of interesting because this would seem like the grander accusation, but it comes second, Bolingbroke accuses Mowbray of having killed or plotted to kill 
Gloucester, one of Bolingbroke's, uh, Bolingbroke's uncle. And Mowbray's response is that he didn't kill Gloucester, but he implies that he was supposed to, either for the good of the kingdom or because he'd had orders from someone higher than him. <clears throat> the king. Historically, Richard most likely had Gloucester murdered for whatever reasons that kings have people murdered. Now, let's compare this scene with Act 4, Scene 1. Who is in charge in each scene? Who is making charges, making accusations, and what are they in each scene? In each scene, the leader clearly wants to avert actual violence. What do all these things, when compared, tell us about the validity, perchance, of the things that Bolingbroke accuses Mowbray of in Act 1, Scene 1? In Act 1, Scene 1, Richard had been in charge, listening as Bolingbroke accused someone. In Act 4, Scene 1, Bolingbroke is in charge as Bagot accuses Almerle of having killed Gloucester, the same Gloucester that Bolingbroke had accused Mowbray of killing in Act 1, Scene 1. Well, isn't that kind of odd? In this scene also, York arrives with news that Richard has agreed to make Bolingbroke his heir. So, this is the culmination of what Bolingbroke has been working toward all along. Bolingbroke is going to be king, and he is getting this, he's usurping the crown. To usurp something is to take a position that isn't yours, and you are taking it from the person to whom it rightfully belongs. Bolingbroke is doing that. He's even getting Richard's cooperation, kind of, sort of, and he's doing it without bloodshed. And Richard, throughout the play, has been shown not to be a very good king. But Bolingbroke is usurping the crown, nonetheless. This is what we meant a little bit ago when we said that although Shakespeare goes out of his way to make it seem that Richard really needs to be deposed, Bolingbroke does not get off looking like a saint here. A little bit later in Act 4, Scene 1, Richard arrives. And this Richard sounds great. This Richard sounds more eloquent, more kingly than the Richard we saw in Act 1, Scene 1. Richard smashes a mirror and he reflects upon the fleeting nature of kingly glory. Read through Richard's speech there. It's wonderful. And it is interesting that Shakespeare chooses late in the play like this to engage now our sympathies for Richard. Why does he do this? I don't know. Our sympathy for Richard grows in Act 5, Scene 1, when Richard gets the news he's going to be taken from the Tower of London to Pomfret, or Pomfret, I'm not sure how one would pronounce it, which is not in London. He's go and he's still going to be imprisoned. And he is going to be separated from his wife, the Queen, who will have to return to France. Richard knows, and we know, and Shakespeare's audience might have known as they were watching this, that this is not good for Richard. He's being taken from the Tower of London to kind of someplace out in the country where essentially he can be murdered um, more easily. Let's back up now to Act 1, Scene 2. Gaunt refuses to take revenge against Richard for the murder of Gloucester. Gaunt's refusal to do this is reflecting the medieval and Renaissance um, love of stability. It's also getting at the idea that the monarch is divinely appointed. In Act 1, Scene 2, Gaunt, 
Later in the play, in Act Two and in Act Five, Scene Three, York, and in Act Five, Scene One, the Bishop of Carlisle, are the voices of tradition. They are the voices of stability. They are the voices of condemnation for usurping the position of a ruler. Act One, Scene Three. Why does Richard call off the combat between Gloucester and, I'm sorry, between Bolingbroke and Mowbray? It sounds as though he fears civil war will result if the combat is allowed to occur. As he leaves, Mowbray asserts that Richard will regret having left Bolingbroke alive. So why would Bolingbroke accuse Mowbray of killing Gloucester in the first place? And we're using a little bit of hindsight here because in Act 4, Scene 1, uh, Bolingbroke, soon to be king, right, sits calmly as someone else is accused of killing Gloucester. So this shows that Bolingbroke knows that Mowbray didn't kill Gloucester. So why would he accuse him of this? Well, if he can spread the idea that Mowbray, on Richard's orders, killed Gloucester, that's going to weaken support for Richard among the nobles. And that is what Bolingbroke is after. Bolingbroke doesn't want civil war. We see this in Act 4, Scene 1, when he, like Richard in Act 1, uh, decides to not allow this interpersonal problem with which he's faced to be solved through violence. And it does sound like Bolingbroke wants to become king with as little bloodshed as possible. In Act 1, Scene 4, we have Richard asserting that he suspects Bolingbroke wants to be king. And it does sound like Bolingbroke is really trying to curry the people's favor. Now, Act 1, Scene 4, Richard says that essentially he's going to strong arm the nobles into giving him money to finance his war. In Act 1, Scene 4, Richard comes across as a jerk. He comes across as snobbish, as someone who is not respecting the rights of the nobles, as someone who despises the common people. Shakespeare here, early in the play, is really working to lower our sympathies for Richard, only to, as we said a minute ago, much later in the play, raise them back up. And in Act 2, Scene 1, as Gaunt is dying, note his long speech as he berates Richard for being a lousy king. Note, too, that Gaunt makes an ill prophecy for Richard. And, as we have learned from Richard III already, in Shakespeare's history plays, prophecies should be heeded. Of course, the question is, is this really a prophecy or is this a shrewd observation? based upon Gaunt's having observed the way things go and his knowing the way things go. Probably the latter. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about Bolingbroke's usurping the crown. In Act 2, Scene 1, when York brings the news that Gaunt is dead and Gaunt's wealth should go to Bolingbroke, Richard decides he will seize Gaunt's wealth, his lands and money and so forth. York is horrified. And this, the seizing of wealth and so forth that should go to Bolingbroke, certainly um, makes Richard look bad among the nobles. And I think we can agree that it would be a justification for Bolingbroke to be, quite frankly, pretty pissed off and maybe even come after Richard. Northumberland brings us the news, in fact, that Bolingbroke has returned to England and that Bolingbroke has had other nobles join him and frankly, they're kicking ass. So we can say, well, Bolingbroke just wants what's his. He wants a little revenge also. But there is no way, look at the timing of this. In Shakespeare's play, and historically, I don't know what the timing was, but in Shakespeare's play, look at the timing of this. Bolingbroke had to have arrived before Gaunt died, and certainly before he could have gotten the news that Richard was going to seize all the stuff that should go to him, Bolingbroke. So, 
yeah, Bolingbroke is rebelling already, and it's just a stroke of good fortune for him that he will be able to use Richard's seizing of Gaunt's wealth, uh, be able to use it later as an excuse. Act 2, Scene 3, around, I don't know, line 120, Bolingbroke does that very thing. But, you know, again, he couldn't possibly have known about it. So, Act 3, Scene 2. Bolingbroke is coming. Richard decides he better get the hell out of there. He decides to flee. So, the writing is on the wall for Richard. We can see this. But here is when Shakespeare starts to make Richard seem more like the king he should have been all along. Richard's language becomes exceedingly eloquent, and he reflects a bit upon the divine right of kings. Whether Shakespeare believed in divine right, who knows. But Richard clearly does, and, and he sounds great before he decides to run away. In Act 3, Scene 3, Bolingbroke keeps up the pretense that he has formed of only wanting what is his. But Richard surrenders to him, and uh, their language tacitly makes clear that they both know Bolingbroke wants the crown, and Richard's going to give it to him. Act 3, Scene 4, like um, a scene in Richard III, I think it's Act 2, Scene 3, but I couldn't tell you that for certain. We don't see much of the common folk, you know, us, the great unwashed in Shakespeare's history plays, but Shakespeare does drop in little bits like this now and again to remind us that the actions of the powerful people do affect the rest of us. And perhaps this is why Bolingbroke has sought to gain favor among the common folk. In Act 5, Scene 2, uh, Bolingbroke gets the news that the common people are with him and they are abusive of Richard. So Bolingbroke has pulled off his sort of popular, not quite bloodless revolution, but it is a revolution still nonetheless. And in Act 5, scene, let's call it 3, is it irony or is it justice that we learn there is already a plot against Bolingbroke, who's not even king yet, but clearly is going to be. In Act 5, Scene 3, the first 20 lines or so, um, we get the first hint of a thing that's going to be a big part of both Henry IV plays. We have Bolingbroke lamenting the party-hearty, uh, ne'er-do-well behavior of his eldest son, Henry. How to his friends. Act 5, Scene 4, King Henry, now King Henry IV, makes, makes it known that he does want Richard dead. And sure enough, Richard becomes dead soon enough. And in Act 5, Scene 5, when folks come to murder Richard, Richard's language, again, is wonderful. It is eloquent. It's kingly. And how awesome is it that he manages to murder, what is it, two of the people that have been sent to murder him before they take him down? This is the Richard that Richard should have been all along. And alas, now it's too late. But in Act 5, Scene 6, note that Henry vows to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to, quote, wash the blood off my hands, or something like that. A pilgrimage that, as we'll see in the uh, Henry IV plays, is never to happen. Okay, guys, that is my really condensed uh, lecture for Richard II. Hope you liked this one. I hope you got something from it. And uh, I will talk to you again regarding Henry IV real soon.